Have you ever thought about those deep connections that you might have with those family members around the table? Or maybe how important are deep-rooted connections? You might be thinking about that as you think about the people that you're deeply rooted with or the deep connections that you have. A deep connection is harder and harder to have in today's world because we are a little bit more superficial than we have been in the past. We like making lots of friends. How many friends do you have on Facebook? How many friends do you have on Instagram? You might say, I have hundreds and hundreds of friends, but how deep do those connections really go? But, you know, the psychologists, they say that the deeper connections that you have, that means the deeper relationships that you have, they can stabilize you if you have a good one. But if you have a bad one, they can do the exact opposite. Um, there's this doctor, uh, a geobiologist, her name is Dr. Hope Yarin, and uh, she said something pretty interesting. She wrote in 2016 this treatise on, um, on, on plant life, but it also was kind of a memoir of her life, and she was kind of thinking about both plant life and relationships, and she says this, no risk is more terrifying than that taken by the first root of a plant, she's talking about, or a tree. A lucky root will eventually find water, but its first job is to anchor. Once the first root is extended, the plant will never again enjoy any hope of relocating to a place less cold, less dry, less dangerous. Indeed, it will face frost, drought, and greedy jaws without any possibilities of fight. And what she's saying here is this, when you put down roots, it takes a risk. When you put down roots, it can be something that you're taking a gamble on. Roots can go down in a tree. They can go down, Dr. Yarn says, 20 to 30 meters, which is about 100 to 130 feet. Now, you've got to be really certain and sure that there's not going to be any animals like beavers around that are going to take you down. You've got to be really sure that there's not going to be any frost or any fire that's going to happen because when you put that root down, that first root, you better get it right. Our world today tells us to put our roots down, and where are they telling us to put our roots down? Our kids, or maybe our youth, or maybe even adults, they say, your roots are founded in how many likes or how many follows you have. Have you put down your roots there before? Been checking your phone constantly to see who's been looking at your pictures? The world might tell us to put down our roots or put down the first root. They might say, put it down in your bank account, or put it down in your career, or put it down in in something that you can stake yourself on and say, I'm going to make a reputation for myself. I'm going to put my root into that. I was talking with a neighbor, an acquaintance, uh, over the last, or about two weeks ago, and we were talking about young people today and about how important it is for them. In their minds, they have this, uh, well, it's true for all of us, but this paralysis of decisions. Like, I need to make the right choice today about my career or I need to take the right degree, or I go to the right school, or I need to make sure that I make the right decision about what I'm going to go into. And they put pressure on themselves, or they have peer pressure, or they have parental pressure that's put onto them. As they put their roots down, they believe that this is the, like, the last decision they're ever going to make in their whole life, and this decision is going to change their world forever. And in a way, it will. But they feel the pressure of putting a root down. Having the right root is important. And having the right root changes everything. That's what was happening in the days of Jeremiah as well. People were putting down roots, but they weren't in the right place. And it was causing, it was causing turmoil. It was causing problems in their life. They, like the world today, tells us to put down our roots in things that don't last, and things that, that, that will go away, our career, or our money, or our influence, or our popularity. Putting down the right root is so key, and it's something that God has thought about as well. He's thought about it for you and me. Because we keep putting down roots in the wrong places, God comes to us, and he comes to the people in Jeremiah's day, and he says, You've put down the roots in the wrong places, and it's a dead end. And yet, I'm going to raise up a righteous branch and create life from a place where there is death. This is the story of Jeremiah, and this is where these words are coming from. 
In the days of Jeremiah, I'm going to read them in just a second, Jeremiah is a prophet that lived about five, six hundred years before Jesus. And the people of Jeremiah's day, they were just like us in many ways. They liked to follow the trends. And the trends of the time said, you know what? Um, God and his promises, they aren't as secure as like having a kingdom and having kings. And so they, they, they put their trust in their kings instead of God. And their kings, they came from David to Solomon, and after Solomon, there were kings that came and ruled them that led them astray and put down roots in the wrong areas. There were kings that said it's good to have Baal worship. Kings like, well, there were some good kings like Josiah who brought them back to God, but most of them were bad. <laughs> they were duds. They said things like we should set up Baal worship all over Judah and Israel. The kingdoms had split at this time. And they said, both kingdoms said we should worship Molech, which actually included child sacrifice. They thought that would be the answer to all of their problems. They were being led astray by their kings. They were being led astray by their leaders. And the people followed. And it's during this time, in this place, that Jeremiah comes and he says a really unpopular message to the king. The king is Hezekiah. He's the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. And Jeremiah comes to King Hezekiah and he says, God's going to bring his judgment. He's going to bring his justice. He's going to discipline this kingdom for, for falling away, for putting down roots in the wrong areas. And he's going to take you away through the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonians were the, the, the world power at this time. And they would come in, Jeremiah said to Hezekiah, and they're going to take Jerusalem, and they're going to take us into captivity. And the king said, no, 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 don't say those things. <clears throat> Hezekiah started getting upset <clears throat> at Jeremiah for saying these things like, God's going to discipline you. And so in the chapter leading up to 33, the king has Jeremiah chained like a dog in his courtyard. <clears throat> and as Jeremiah's there in the courtyard and he's, he's chained up, he says to the king, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And the king says, don't speak this way, don't speak this way. He was trying to silence him. And in the middle of it all, Jeremiah says, don't be afraid, because although God's going to take you into captivity through the Babylonians, he's going to have a return. Because you've broken the covenant again and again and again, that doesn't mean that God has not been faithful. And he's going to be faithful to you again. And so this is what he says <clears throat> During his prophecy, he says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, The Lord Our Righteousness. Having the right roots means holding God to his promises. Having the right roots means relying on, trusting on God's promises. That's why Jeremiah begins the way that he does. He says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. Well, what's the good promise he made to the people of Israel and Judah? From the very beginning of time, when you and I, individually and collectively, through our first parents, rejected God and say, said to him, God, my way is better than your way. I'm going to follow my plans and not your plans. From that moment that Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they should have been wiped off the face of the earth, you and I ate together. And yet God came to them and made a good promise. What was his good promise? He said, I'm going to send a conqueror who's going to defeat death. I'm going to send one that's going to undo all the things that you did to say no to me. I'm going to send one to crush Satan's head. He made a good promise. That's what Jeremiah is saying. From that time on, uh, God made good promises to his people. What were some of his other good promises that he made? He came to a man and a woman, Abram and Sarah, who were barren, they couldn't have any children, and what did God say to them? He made a what? A good promise. Say it with me. A good promise that they 
would be the parents of a great nation, and all nations would be blessed through them because God makes good on his promises. God is the God of good promises. When he says that God has made good on his promises and God has promised Israel and Judah, when that nation became a great nation and that nation was in Egypt and got enslaved by Pharaoh and was at risk of being wiped off of the face of the earth because there was genocide, emphasized against the babies in that land, God made a good promise to Moses saying, Moses, I'm going to use you to bring the people out of Egypt and to save this nation because God is the God of good promises and God made good on his promise again. And when they got out of that land and they approached Cana, Can- uh, Canaan, uh, they went into that land and there were giants, there were huge people and the spies, they said, we can never defeat these people. These people are too big. The armies are too strong. But God made good on his promise, and he said to his people, it's not by your strength that you're going to take this land, it's by my love and my grace and my will that you will take this land, because God is the God of what? Good promise. Now, I'm asking you today, December 1st, 2024, do you think God has stopped being the God of good promise? (laughs) When you have good roots, you have a God who is a God of good promise. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. So when the check engine light comes on, when the walls are falling down around your house, (laughs) metaphorically or maybe physically, I don't know, when you burn the turkey, literally, or maybe you burnt the turkey this Thanksgiving metaphorically with your family, I don't know, I don't know how it went. You know that you have a God that has good promise. And he hasn't changed. Jeremiah locked up like a dog in Hezekiah's courtyard saying these things. God is a God of good promise. Even in your bad times, even in the times that you can say things are not going well or you don't understand the plan, you have a God of good promise. But that's not the only thing about having the right root. Having the right root also means this. Verse 15. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. Look at that, verse 15, one more time. Having the right root means trusting God's plan. He says, in those days and at that time. I don't know about you, but when I'm thinking about God's timing, I'm not thinking about those days and his time. I'm thinking about what? My days and my time. And yet Jeremiah is coming and he's saying this to the people. He says, you're going to grow frustrated. And by the way, the invasion would happen during Jeremiah's lifetime. 586... B.C., the Babylonians would come in and they would invade and they would destroy the temple and it would look like, this doesn't look like God's time at all. This doesn't look like God's plan. This doesn't look like his plan at all. Why is he taking us away? Our plans are misguided, but God's plan is during his days and his times. So this year, I actually was pretty proud of the turkey. It was the first year that I tried the smoked turkey on my Traeger grill that Hannah got me last year for Christmas, which I was really jazzed about because I had some friends this year that said, now that you have the smoker, <clears throat> here are a couple of videos and watch them. Thank you, Adam Winkleman. He was also uh, Annie and he are uh, heading up our fellowship brunch coming up in just a little bit. So I was thankful, Adam, that you gave me those videos because that thing turned out great. I stuffed, uh, I did the clean, the full clean turkey, like you wash inside and outside of the skin, just like the videos show that I looked up online. I followed the instructions right down to the T. I stuffed the turkey with thyme and with herbs and with uh, shallots and with with garlic, like half a garlic clove. I put that thing in there because I really like garlic. And I put it into the smoker and it came out pretty good. I'd say I could do some improvement next year. I could find some tips and some tricks. I got that kind of feeling that you get after you do something really well, like you do one thing well, and then you say to yourself, oh, I'm pretty good at cooking. (laughs) So the next morning, 
we have all these leftovers, right, in the fridge. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've done an egg bake before. And I wonder what a turkey egg bake would be like, because my turkey is so good. And I just kind of like want to show off to my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, they're in town. And so I say, you know, there's recipes online, but I was tired of reading the recipes online. I'm like, recipes. I had only followed all the recipes the day before, but now I'm going to do it not according to the recipes plan. I'm going to do it according to my plan. So I got the stuff, I got the stuffing out. I got the leftover mashed potatoes. Those mashed potatoes make a great lining for this pan. And I got the eggs out. I put together the stuffing in the eggs and the turkey in the eggs, and I mix it all together. Here's some sour cream that's left over. I'm going to throw that in there as well. And man, and there's the herbs. Oh, the extra thyme, the extra herbs, the extra shallots. And look, there's actually like a half a thing of garlic that's left, a half head of garlic that's left. Let's just do that too. I put the half head of garlic in. Yeah, you heard me right. I put the half head of garlic in. Baked it in the Traeger for 45 minutes, and boy, did it smell amazing. I love the smell of garlic, but then as I watched my father-in-law take the first bite, did you hear me say that? I put half a head of garlic in. I took a bite, and I thought to myself, no vampire is going to be around me for the next month. And I'll tell you the truth, even up to yesterday, I was sitting in my office typing out the rest of this sermon, and I smelt my hands. I was sweating garlic up to yesterday, last night. So if y'all, that's why I'm up on the stage, and you're there. I did it according to my plan, and how did it turn out? Bad. Well, actually, Dad said this. He said, not bad. And then Mom said, can you be more polite? And he said, I said it wasn't bad. (laughs) It wasn't good, I'll say that. When you and I make plans according to our own plans, and this is what Jeremiah is trying to get across to his people of his day, when you do it your own way, and you try to put down your roots your own way and say, I don't need the recipe, I don't need God, it's not going to turn out well. And the fact is, is that when he's speaking about this branch, he's saying, I have my days and my time. He's saying, I have my recipe for a righteous branch to, a righteous branch to sprout from David's line. Did you get the context already about Jeremiah? That kingdom was a dead kingdom. They have rejected God. They're like a stump in the ground. Have you ever had that stump in the ground that is just dead and you can't get rid of it? God's saying in this text, he's saying, I'm going to bring a righteous branch. My plan is that I'm going to bring life in a place that there is death. And you can't do this on your own. You need me to do it for you. My friends, you and I, we need grace. We need forgiveness. And the recipe isn't you have to follow Jesus and follow his example in order to be right with God or you need to be better or you need to do better or you need to climb the mountain. The answer is Jesus needs to make new life in you. And he does. He has to because we're the dead branch. We're the ones that are running after likes and dopamine hits online. We're the ones that are that are trying to find significance in our bank accounts. We're trying to find significance in our power and our influence. We're the ones trying to follow the recipe card and saying, we're opening up the fridge and say, I got it my own way. God says, no, you don't just not have it your own way. You have it all backwards and your roots are not in the right place. But in order to have the right roots, it means trusting God's promises, but it's also trusting his plan. Are you ready for his plan? This is how we have to close today. In the last verse, he says, In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Having the right root means trusting in God's person. Who is the fulfillment of that promise to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? The conqueror who would come into the world. It didn't come in a 10-step, a 12-step plan that you and I have to do. It came in God giving us a person. This is what Advent is all about. This is what these metaphors, the messianic metaphors that we're talking about all month in our sermon series are all about. That conqueror, the head crusher, came into this world and in order to crush Satan's head, he gave his life on a cross. That's God's promise. That's God's plan. That's God's person. And what about that great nation promised to Abraham and to Sarah? 
How would that nation be a blessing to all nations? That blessing would come to us, give his life to take away our sins, rise again, and then he would come to his disciples and he would say, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the conqueror who came that is blessing all nations. All nations, he says. Baptize them. Teach them. The fulfillment of God's promises and his plan came in the person of Jesus, who is the prophet better than Moses. Because Moses, although he gave us the Ten Commandments, God handed them to them, and Moses told his people, keep these commandments. Jesus says, you've broken these commandments again and again. Repent, and I forgive you, and I take your life, and I make it mine. And I make my life, my perfect life, my righteous life, the righteous branch, and I give it to you. That's the person. That's God's promise. That's God's plan. He's the king greater than King David. Because from his kingdom, and the verses right after this, by the way, talk about this a little bit more, he's the king that would rule on the throne forever. The people of Jeremiah's day might be scratching their heads and they might be saying to themselves, I don't see a king ruling forever. They might say to themselves, I don't see how our nation is blessing all other nations who are being taken into captivity. But for those that believe Jeremiah's words, and I believe those people are right here in this room, as I pray they were back then. You and I have put down roots in all sorts of different places, but the one root that matters is God's promises, his good promises that he's never let you down on. They're his good plans, not man's plans, but his plans. And they're not during our time or our days, but he does them according to his time and his days, and they're according to his person your Savior, the righteous, rant, the righteous branch that has given you life and salvation. So in closing, let me ask you, how are you going to take this into your life? How are you going to take this into your world? How are you going to take this into Advent? You can't keep it to yourself. Go and share. When the plans aren't going just the right way that you think that they should, go to the God that says, that my plans and my days they're the days and they're the plans that I've set for you. And when the promises that people have broken with you, or maybe you've broken for them, when those promises don't come through, remember the one that has made a promise that has come true and will come true. Your Savior and your God, and now you're finding deep connection. Now you're finding deep root in a relationship and the someone and the person that has given you life. Life forever, because out of the dead stump, he's made a righteous branch. Amen. Amen.